Family Theater presents Ruth Hussey and Robert Newton. From Hollywood, the Mutual Network, in cooperation with Family Theater, presents transcribed Namge Dula, starring Robert Newton. To introduce the drama, here is your hostess, Ruth Hussey. Thank you, Tony Lafrano. Family theater's only purpose is to bring to everyone's attention a practice that must become an important part of our lives if we're to win peace for ourselves, peace for our families, and peace for the world. Family theater urges you to pray. Pray together as a family. And now to our drama starring Robert Newton as Rudyard Kipling. On the road to Tibet, many miles up in the Himalayas, is a kingdom, exactly four miles square. The ruler of the kingdom was a man whose revenues were rather less than 400 pounds a year. And these were expended in the maintenance of one elephant and a standing army of five men. This king, whose name does not matter, was a tributary to Her Majesty's Indian government. And I had set out from Simla town with my assistant, Mr. Leach, in response to the king's urgent request that a representative of the crown visit him at once. His unspeakable majesty has blooming gratitude that you arrived to restrain the danger upon us. We'll be happy to help in any way we can. Precisely what is this danger? Only as escorts are we, with also as you regard the army. <laughs> the army? Does he mean them five ragged blokes standing back under the trees? They seem to be carrying rifles. Look more like old fowl in pieces to me. It is our honor that you be taken to the palace where waits himself the king. Come. It is a great pleasure that you do me, sahibs. And how has your honored presence the felicity to be? We are both well, your majesty. And you? Since you have set your magnificent feet upon my kingdom, the crop will doubtless yield twice its average. Then things are going nicely. Things are miserable. In what way? One among my subjects, a man of many shortcomings, he has all but paralyzed the executive. One man is gumming up your old kingdom? One. What are this man's crimes, Ra uh, Raja Sahib? First, he is an outlander and no man of my own people. A man's birth is hardly a crime. Second, since my favor, I give him land upon his first coming, he refuses to pay revenue. Ah. Yes. Am I not the lord of the earth above and below, entitled by right and custom to one-eighth of the crop? Yet this devil establishing himself refuses to pay a single tax, and he brings a poisonous spawn of babes. He has a large family? An immensity. And majesty, he worships strange gods. For that, Prime Minister, I have no concern. It is the rebellion that offends me. It is to be remembered also that he refuses the... Ah, yes, 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 the forced labor on the roads. And more, he stirs up my people to the light reason. Yet he is, when he wills, an expert log snatcher. There is none better or bolder among my people to, to clear a block of the river when the logs stick fast. The king has an army. Have them cast this man into jail. Well, I, I sent my army against him once, Sahib, when his excuses grew wearisome. Of their heads, he break three across the top with a stick. What happened to the other two? They ran away. Also, the guns would not shoot. Most embarrassing. But it is to be remembered that he is very expert log snatcher and a man of a merry face. What shall I do with him, Sahib? If it be the king's permission, I will not strike my tents until the third day. And I will see this man. You have my leave. The following morning, a crier went through the village, proclaiming that there was a large log jam on the river, 
and that it behove all loyal subjects to remove it. The people poured down to the river bank, and the king, Leech, and I went along with them. Suddenly a shout went up from the crowd along the bank. And a large, red-haired villager hurried up, stripping off his clothes as he ran. Here now. Who's that red-headed bloke? That is he. That is the rebel Nangedula. Now the dam will be cleared. What did you call him, Raja Sahib? Nangedula. But why has he red hair? He is an outlander. Watch now. Watch him snag the logs. Namgadula had scrambled out on the jam and was clawing out the butt of a log with a rude sort of boat hook. It slid forward slowly as an alligator moves. Three or four others followed it, and the green water spouted through the gaps that they made. Then the villagers howled and shouted and scrambled across the logs, and the red head of Namge Dula was chief among them all. Well, don't be blooming at. Look at them logs start a moving, will you now? Oh, did I not say he was expert? <laughs> and he is the troublemaker you spoke of. One and the same. Surely he is a bold and worthy man among my logs. He is indeed. Look there now. He got the jam broke loose and he's dived underwater to keep free of the tree trunks. Watch, watch. In a minute he will pop to the surface by the bank, his red head flaming. By Jove, you're right. There he is. The redness of his shock head and beard was startling. And in the thicket of hair, wrinkled above high cheekbones, shone two merry blue eyes. He was indeed an outlander, but yet a Tibetan in language, habit, and attire. He spoke the Lepchi dialect with an indescribable softening of the gutturals. It was not so much a lisp as an accent. I asked him where he came from. His blue eyes twinkled. From the Tibet! He pointed across the hills and grinned. That grin went straight to my heart. Mechanically, I put out my hand and Namge Dula shook it. No pure Tibetan would have understood the meaning of the gesture. Then he turned and went to look for his clothes. We watched him as he climbed back up to the village. Blimey, if there aren't something frightful familiar about that bloke. That's precisely how he struck me, Leech. Like a chap using his winning ways on you. Ah, truly, sahibs, he is a man of compelling spirit. But I know that before long there will be complaints of him in the court. Let us return to the palace to do justice. Oh, I told you, Sahib. Again, it is Namge Dula. What is it this time? Not content with refusing revenue on his own part, he has bound a dozen of his neighbors by an oath to the like treason. And who is this man standing before you? He had been of the conspiracy, but has confessed everything hoping for my favor. I see. Never before has such a thing befallen me. Call this red-headed outlander to your tent tonight and speak harshly to him. Very well. He may listen to you. That evening, Namge Dula came to my tent, and I made an attempt to lecture him. But for the life of me, I couldn't keep countenance. At every turn, he would grin persuasively and change the subject. There's a brown bear in a poppy field by the river. Would Sahib care to shoot it? We are not here to speak of bears, but on the sin of conspiracy and the certainty of punishment. Oh, it is a big brown bear, Sahib, and slow. Truly a fine animal for shooting. No, now you listen to me. You have openly conspired to defraud your king of what is lawfully due to him. Do you realize how serious that is? Namge Dula's face clouded for a moment. Shortly afterwards, he withdrew from my tent, and I heard him singing softly to himself among the pines. The words were unintelligible to me, but the tune, like his liquid, insinuating speech, seemed the ghost of something strangely familiar. He sang it again and again, and I racked my brain for that lost song. It wasn't until after dinner that Leach discovered someone had cut a square foot of velvet from my best camera cloth. Do a thing like this. Only someone with a vengeful and completely irresponsible nature. Meaning Namge Dula? Take your gun, Leech. We're going to have a look at that poppy field. 
We started down the valley in hopes of encountering the brown bear. We could hear him grunting like a discontented pig in the poppy field. And we waited shoulder deep in the dew dripping Indian corn to catch him after his meal. The moon was at full and dew out of the rich scent of the tassel crop. And then in the distance, we heard an anguished bellow. Hello, what was that? It sounded like a young cow. I can't think what any blooming cow would have to howl about in this country. It's worth a bloke's life to touch one of the black crummies. Shh. Something's coming this way. I see him, sir. Two shadows. Looks like a bear and a cub. Don't move each. They'll pass very close to us. I got him in my sight, sir. Shall I? No, no. Look. Look at their heads. Hello. They... They got red hair, and they're wearing some kind of a mask. Let them go by. Well, Lyle, it was Namge Doolittle and one of his brats. And did you notice, sir, the little one was trailing a kind of rope behind him? I did. And then blooming masks, shining like black velvet on their faces. Black velvet is exactly the word for it, Leech. Namge Dula made those masks out of my camera cloth. <laughs> By next morning, the kingdom was in an uproar. During the night, Namge Dula had gone forth and cut off the tail of a cow belonging to the rabbit faced villager who betrayed him. It was a sacrilege unspeakable against the holy cow. The state desired blood, but Namge Dula had retreated into his hut barricaded the doors and windows with big stones and defied the world. The king ordered his army against the hut, but there were difficulties. I didn't know Namge Dula had a rifle, Your Majesty. He has indeed, Sahib. Mm, and it seems extremely well cared for. It is the only gun in the state that can shoot. Next year, I will certainly buy a little cannon. Tell me, is there a priest in the kingdom to whom he will listen? He worships his own god. We can starve him out. Look, Namke Dool is making a sign for quiet from the window. What now is working in his evil brain? Let's hear what he has to say. Listen! Listen all of you to Namke Dula! Let the white sahib approach. All others I will kill. Send me the white sahib. I think he means you, sir. I approached the door of Namge Dula's hut. It was thrown open and I entered the smoky interior, crammed with children, and every child had red flaming hair. A raw cow's tail lay on the floor, and by its side two pieces of black velvet, my black velvet, rudely hacked into the semblance of a mask. Welcome, welcome. And what is this shame? Oh, there is no shame. I did but cut off the tail of that man's cow. He betrayed me! I was minded to shot, shot him, Sahib, but not to death. Indeed, not to death. Only in the legs. And why at all? Since it is the custom to pay revenue to the king, why at all? By the god of my father. I cannot tell. And who was your father? The same that had this gun. <laughs> Without relinquishing his hold upon it, he showed me his weapon, a tower musket, bearing the date 1832 and the stamp of the Honorable East India Company. The gun was his. And your father's name? Timle Dula. At the first, I being then a little child, it is in my mind that he, he wore a red coat. Of that I have no doubt. Repeat the name of your father three or four times. Tim Neidula, Tim Neidula, Tim Neidula, Tim Neidula! To this hour, I worship his God. May I see that God? In a little while, at twilight time. Do you remember anything of your father's speech? Ah, uh, it is long ago. But there is one word which he said often. Thus. Then I and my brethren stood upon our feet, our hands to our sides. Thus. I see. 
And who was your mother? A woman of the hills. We being lepchas of Darjeeling. But me they call an outlander because my hair is... <laughs> as you see. At this point, his wife, a Tibetan woman, touched him on the arm gently. The long parley outside had lasted far into the day. It was now close upon twilight, the hour of the Angelus. Very solemnly, the red-headed children rose from the floor and formed a semicircle. Namge Dula lighted a little oil lamp and set it before a recess in the wall. Pulling aside a curtain of dirty cloth, he revealed a worn brass crucifix leaning against the helmet badge of a long-forgotten East India regiment. Then he turned and looked at me briefly. Thus did my father. And then, clumsily with his right hand, Namge Dula crossed himself. The wife and children followed suit. Then all together, they struck up the wailing chant that I'd heard on the hillside. And suddenly, I was puzzled no longer. Again and again they crooned it, as if their hearts had break. Their version of the chorus of the wearing of the green. They're hanging men and women too for the wearing of the green. A moment later the ceremony was over. Namge Dula drew the curtain across the recess. Thus my father sang. There was much more, but I have forgotten. I do not know the meaning of these words, but it may be that God will understand. It may indeed. That then is the substance. I am not of these people. And I will not pay revenue. And why? <laughs> it would mean an end to all the fighting and clamor. What occupation would then be to me between crop and crop? You do this only for the amusement. It is better than scaring bears. But these people do not understand. Amusement is one thing, Namge Dula. But the sin of maiming the cow, consider that. Ah, that is true. But, oh, Sahib, that man betrayed me. And I had no thought. But the heifer's tail waved in the moonlight. <laughs> and I had my knife. That is no excuse. What else should I have done? The tail came off before I was aware. Sahib, thou knowest more than I. That is true. Uh, stay within the door. I'll go speak with the king. <laughs> Raha Sahib, <clears throat> there are two courses open to your wisdom. Mm. Two courses. You can either hang him from a tree, he and his brood, till there remains no hair that is red within Don't, the land. No, 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 no. Why should I hurt the little children? Or, discarding the impiety of the cow maiming, you can raise him to honor in the army. Huh? To honor in the army? Make him chief of your army. Oh, chief? Oh, enlist him in the army, perhaps. But to make him chief of all five? Prime Minister, advise me. Consider, Majesty, his is the gun that shoots. Make him chief and give him honors as may befall and a full allowance of work. Feed him with words and favor uh, and also from uh, certain bottles that you know of. But beware, Raja Sahib, of one thing. And that? He has brethren. Oh, oh, no, no. And if his brethren come, they will surely fight with each other till they die. So prohibit their coming. It is prohibited. Then it is to be the army. Oh, the army. You may announce it to him. Namge Dula. Is it the white Sahib that calls? Come forth, Namge Dula, and command the king's army. Your name shall no more be Namge in the mouths of men, but Patsy Dula. For, as you have said, I know. And then Namge Dula, new christened Patsy Dula, 
son of Timle Dula, which is Tim Doolan. Gone very wrong indeed, emerged quickly from his hut, clasped the king's feet, cuffed the standing army, and hurried in an agony of contrition from temple to temple making offerings for the sin of cattle stealing. It was some hours later, as we rode back along the hardened dirt road to similar town, that Leech told me of the king's magnanimous offer. He was so pleased, sir, that he took me aside, the king himself, and offered to sell us one of his villages for 20 pounds sterling. Well, that shouldn't cut very deeply into your pension, Leech. I'm surprised you didn't strike a bargain with him. Oh, no. I'd buy no villages in the Himalayas so long as one red head flares between them climbing glaciers and the dark birch forest. No? No, sir. I know that breed. Hussie again. I remember once when I was a very little girl, I was running along the sidewalk to catch up with the ice cream wagon. Being very intent on catching the wagon, I wasn't really watching where I was running, and my foot happened to catch on a pavement stone that was a little higher than the rest. Down I went. My knees were skinned, my hands were skinned, and to make matters worse, the ice cream wagon turned the corner and was gone. It was quite a catastrophe, and I was very, very unhappy as I went running home to my mother and father. I was tearful and wounded, but I knew my mother and father could fix things up. Every child has something like that happen, and most children know instinctively that mother and father are ready, willing, and in most cases, able to remedy the situation. Why is it, then, that we sometimes forget what, what, to do that when we grow up? Our Heavenly Father is always there, always ready to help us with our problems. And if we would only remember to take our problems to God, acknowledge our dependence on him, and ask his help, our lives would be so much less complicated. Just a few minutes each day to ask for God's help and to thank him for his blessings can be most fruitful. We do at my house. Every day we gather for the good old custom of family prayer. We find it very beneficial. And then, too, the family that prays together stays together. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. From Hollywood, Family Theater has brought you Namge Dula, starring Robert Newton. Ruth Hussey was your hostess. Others in our cast were Jay Novello, Bill Woodson, Jack Crucian, and Tudor Owen. This adaptation of Namge Dula by John T. Kelly was performed with the permission of the estate of Rudyard Kipling through the cooperation of Doubleday and Company. Music was composed and conducted by Harry Zimmerman, and the production was directed and transcribed for Family Theater by Joseph F. Mansfield. This is Tony Lofrano expressing the wish of Family Theater that the blessing of God may be upon you and your home and inviting you to be with us next week when Family Theater will present Safe at Home, starring Barbara Hale, Bill Williams, and Betty Lynn. Join us, won't you? <laughs> Family Theater is broadcast throughout the world and originates in the Hollywood studios of the world's largest network. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.